coming out. As you know, this is Lunch Break presented by Minorities in Sports and Comcast NBC Universal Sports Tech um, slash Boomtown Accelerators. So just to give just a quick intro on me, my name is Shina Wheel. I'm the CEO and founder of Minorities in Sports. We are a national networking organization for people of color who work on the business side of sports. So we're very easy to find if you need to find us. Just Google Minorities in Sports Business or look up my name, um, Shina Wheel, and it should come up. Uh, so we're going to go into our awesome, awesome panelists today. First, we have Hawk. So if you can give us a quick intro on yourself. Yeah, what's up, everybody? Uh, Hawk, uh, also known as Andrew Hawkins. I am the co-founder and president of Status Pro, which is a sports technology company that um, majors in building gaming and training solutions. We launched our first consumer product in September called NFL Pro Era, which was the first um, ever professional league simulation sports game in VR. Um, working in a number of sports, um, and my personal background is uh, played professional football for for nine years, including in the NFL. Um, also graduated from Columbia with my master's degree and was a the former head of business development at Spring Hill, um, which is the media marketing companies of LeBron James and Maverick Carter. Thanks, Hawk, and my fellow Columbia alum. Um, next, we're going to go over to Jose. If you can just give a quick intro on who you are and your company and what you do. Hi, everyone. I'm Jose Vietes. I'm the uh, investment director for Comcast Sports Tech uh, and one of the founders of Boomtown Accelerators. And my role is to identify and look for uh, top talent in the sports tech world uh, that are solving, uh, looking for startups that are solving interesting problems uh, in sports tech uh, and then connecting them with our partners that you see here on my screen um, for the sake of getting deals done, commercial deals, pilots, et cetera. Uh, my background's in industrial engineering, user experience, and computer science. Did my undergrad at Stanford and got an MBA after CU Boulder, um, and then been living in Colorado for the last 10 years. Awesome. Thank you, Jose. And we'll finish off with Jay. Hi, everybody. Jay Headley here. Uh, like Jose, I studied industrial engineering. Uh, then I went into the Air Force as a United States fighter pilot. Uh, explained a little bit about how that helped me with the idea. Um, when I left the Air Force, got my MBA at Harvard University. Uh, and then went into uh, the corporate world in uh, digital. I ran digital for a company called Accenture. Uh, so that's Internet of Things, um, interactive, uh, AI, things like that. And so all of those uh, points of my background came together for me to start the company that I've, um, I'm the co-founder of called Headvantage. So think wearable technology that our goal is to put you in the mind of the athlete. So not only what the athlete could see from cameras embedded in hats and helmets, but where their eyes are actually actually tracking and combining that with telemetry. And so it started, like I said, in the fighter jet with how we looked out the front of the airplane and recorded everything in the heads up display of the HUD. And we used that tape for training, but all you athletes out there know that the footage you see of yourself training is never from your vantage point. It's some other camera somewhere else. So the idea is, how do we get the vantage point of the athlete on film and train them that way? And of course, fans want to see that. Therefore, networks want to broadcast that. That brought us to, uh, to Comcast and happy to be on the panel today. Thank you. Thank you. So um, do want to make just a quick announcement. One, I think depending on which link you clicked, I said this earlier, but um, your name may be coming up as my name. So if you can just change your name over to your name, that would be great. This conversation is being recorded right now. It's just to go to all the registrants. So just in case you have to jump early or um, for those who couldn't make it for whatever reason, um, we will be sending this out to everyone so they can you know, watch it at their own leisure. And um, lastly, today is NFL draft day. So we only have Hawk for about 30 minutes. So we definitely wanna make sure we get some questions in before he has to jump um, and go do his fun stuff over for the new draftees. So I wanted to start out by asking you all, um, as founders of color, what has been a significant challenge that you face and what are the things that you've done to overcome it? And either one of you can start. What's on Hawk go since he might leave soon? Um, I, you know, I think one of the biggest obstacles is just, you know, when you're doing something new that there's no blueprint for it. And I think, um, you know, from 
you know, a VC standpoint of raising money to, you know, uh, partnerships to even down to the consumer, right? When you're, when you look different than what people are used to seeing of companies that are in your sector, it, there's no comp, right? And so just the natural thing for anyone to do is just say, oh, I've never seen this before. It won't work, right? And so overcoming that, I think has been probably one of the tougher things as, as again, being a, a founder of color, but I think how we've overcome it is we've just tried to continue to major in the thing that we know best and try to make sure we're centered our value proposition on something that if 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 anybody was to build this version of what we're trying to build um they would have to come to us anyway right like and that's that's we try to make sure that we have something that is unique to us and over time as people continue to build the appetite for what we're building um hopefully we become kind of the the category leaders yeah, I'll, I'll answer that um, another another related way. But when you ask, well, how is it different for me being a founder of, of color? Part of the answer is it's not different, right? All, all the problems I've got are the same problems anyone would have to a point, right? Um, all some of the things Hawk mentioned, right? The technology, the, the funding, the community, the customers, all that stuff. None of that's easy. The other part of the answer is I don't know. And that's one of the reasons we even have programs like MIS, right? There's an insidious bias. And it's not as if someone's just going to come tell you, uh, I'm not investing in you because you're a minority. No one would ever say that, right? It just happens. We know the math. So you sort of have to operate as if that's that's not happening. But in the back of your mind, math says that it is. So how do you overcome that? Um, <clears throat> I won't say I've overcome it. I don't know if you ever overcome it. But um trying to be successful in spite of the odds, right? So have an excellent idea, have an excellent team, work very, very hard, be very smart. All the things I would tell anybody, right? But if, if you're someone that um, you have a, a, a smaller chance of being trusted, which is the bottom line here, right? Therefore, you've got to eliminate those reasons for somebody not to, not to trust you as best that you can. Yeah, it's good. Uh, mine, mine's similar to that, which is, you know, venture capital and the the startup world is a lot of it is pattern recognition, right? Seeing what has worked in the past and uh, and seeing whether that fits what, who, the startup you're you're speaking to uh, fits a certain mold, you know, that uh, of potential success or failure. Um, and so, you know, being less than three percent Hispanics in in, in tech, uh, you you know, that's at least one variable that's different to the mold. That uh, when when I'm speaking to an investor or a uh, potential partner, et cetera. So, um, what the way that I've solved it is, you know, I'm, I've lived all or, all around the world, and I've often been the outsider, whether it was in Spain or LA or uh, the Bay Area or Colorado. Um, and it's it's learning um, it's learning about the culture of the individuals you're speaking to 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 better understand them and and learning just to uh, just just understanding that the audience that you're speaking to, um, and as opposed to assuming that they think less or differently of you, uh, rather figuring out, okay, how do they take and how do you, how do you interact with them? Um, and that's going to be a, a reality, even with other people that look like you, right? Like just because there's two people from South America, doesn't mean that they understand each other and they, and they work the same. Right. So I think often, um, we assume that because we're surrounded by people that look like us, that you can just, you know, coast and you, you're welcome, but, I think the challenge is, is just as much there when you're the only person of color in a room, uh, because you might be speaking to many people that uh, might not might not be of color, but it doesn't mean that their backgrounds are the same, right? So you know, someone from Georgia versus San Francisco, uh, you know, they're they're, they're going to be they're going to have different backgrounds. So uh, a lot of what I've learned over the years is is get to know people and listen and identify what um, you know, get to know them and 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 then figure out how the game works, right? <laughs> it's really a game, startup fundraising, et cetera, as a game and, and figure out what the rules are that are implicit or explicit. And um, and as opposed to jumping to conclusions or admitting defeat, it's like, okay, let's figure this out. Let's let's get to know people and, and work with them because um, that's, that's what we have to do. Yeah, I wanna pity, piggyback a little bit off of that. So Hawk, being that you're a former NFL player um, and a founder of color, 
I would assume that some of your conversations weren't the easiest when you went to investors or when you were talking to people in the industry um, to just believe in, in your work, right? What were some of the things that you did to kind of just move past that? Like what were, how, what did you use from your experience as an NFL player, as a business person who's been very successful since you've left the league to help your conversation with investors? I think the thing that's helped me the most is just uh, probably a little bit of my track record, right? Like I, I wanted to make sure even this is obviously prior to me starting or at least going to raise money for the business was that I had a reputation that preceded me and that that took time. That's even why I went to Columbia, you know, to, to the, you know, uh, Jose and Jay's point of just, you know, there's a certain... Um, playbook that people are used to seeing in success there are certain names that are associated with that that people are used to so I'm trying to combat you know what may look unconventional on one side with you know enough candy or enough medicine with the candy to make sure that they still see things that they're used to right and so for me I use my NFL experience a lot as I do the fact that I've you know worked and helped build Spring Hill um into a successful startup in business um, as I also use Columbia and even what I'm doing from our company, a product standpoint specifically, like it's not in the sense of like, oh, I'm an NFL player. You should invest in me. I'm cool. No, I think things that help me are that we are building technology that unlocks a last level of access for fans to now have control over the thing that they've never had to got to see the game from, right? Like they've never seen the game from a field level I know that's a fantasy of every fan because I was a fan that had that that fantasy as well. And who better to build that experience than, the, than people that were there, like myself? And like when we build our games, we build our experiences. This isn't something we're guessing. Like we are putting in actual insight that you can only have if you've been there before and understand what the sounds are like. Understand what walking out of the tunnel feels and sounds like. Understand what songs play in Pittsburgh in the third quarter. And then put that in the experience, right? And so. I use my NFL experience to showcase why I'm the person to build um, the company that we're building. Um, and, and to their point, you, you can't really say who vibes with that and who doesn't, who doesn't matter what you say or, or, or what does, but you have to go into every conversation to Jay's point, like this is a story that tracks, this is a story that makes sense. And ultimately, you know, you think that's going to get you over the hump. Yeah, that definitely makes sense. Chris, I saw that you raised your hand. Do you want to jump in real quick with a question? And yeah, that's I'm, super interactive too. So um, definitely for the Jay and Jose, jump in when you want to. Um, and if you have a question, either put it in the chat or you can raise your hand. Awesome. Yeah, thanks, Shine. It's good to see you again. Um, and, and Hawk, I think I saw you. Didn't you present at the SBJ Tech Week? Did I see you on stage there? Yeah, I did. Cool. I did. Cool yeah. Yep. So, um, so one one thing that occurs to me, you know, and this this is mainly for Hawk, but Jay, you have a somewhat similar background. It's like, so you you're you're playing in the NFL, in college sports. It's all consuming, right? I mean, you, like you barely have a spare minute to get your homework done or to call home because you're you know you you got your schoolwork, you got, and then when you get in the NFL, you know they expect you to be studying all the time, knowing the playbook, working out all the time, and. So I, I, I'm just curious, what are some of the things that you did in your transition from your from your athletic career to that business career? How did you squeeze it in? How did you how did you find those, those the, the, uh, the chance to build the skills to find those opportunities? And what can people maybe learn from that experience of transitioning from an athlete to the business that we can actually help with others getting in a similar situation because there's a lot of great you know minds out there to play app to play sports, but making that transition is often really hard, right? Like there's not a lot of pro or college athletes that are able to make a really successful tr transition to a technology career to a startup career. Yeah. That's a that's a great question. Um, Jay, you want to you want to jump in first? Well, uh, sure. So I, I mentioned earlier my my background. Um, out of engineering school as a United States fighter pilot. And most of the fighter pilots, when we, any pilot in the Air Force, when we were finished, 99% of them go to fly airlines because that's what they know and they, they're comfortable doing that. That wasn't that interesting to me. Um, so what did I have to do? I had to go learn something else. So learn, 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 right? And figure out how to learn fast and efficiently. 
And that's one of the things that um, was really important to me to make the, the transition from a totally different world to the, the world of, of business and technology. And this is kind of a hybrid here, right? So I would say anything you can do to increase your knowledge quickly is really, really important uh, to do, especially if you're transitioning from something uh, to something different. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. I, I mean, very, very similar here. I would say that the thing that I learned in sports, and, and at least in my athletic career, the, the people who show up the most, the people who show up early, and the people who stay late are successful. Um, entrepreneurship isn't for everybody. Um, but I would say, typically, the people who are successful on this side are very much the same way. And so when I was in sports, I, I put everything I, that I could into that. I learned everything I possibly could. From day one, I was that kind of person and player. And I knew going into something else because I was successful in one area wouldn't make me successful in the other one. And so I made the time to make sure I put that time in. Um, I did go back to Columbia while I was in the NFL. So in the off season, I would be training and flying back and forth to New York for classes, which was very hard. And it was stressful and all the things that you would imagine. But it was me trying to not only lay the groundwork for everyone else to see that I'm serious about what I'm doing, but also for myself. I didn't want to go into any area that I didn't put the adequate amount of work in to learn the ropes and just think I would be successful. And I went from there into internships and to build other companies and to, again, service and just kind of be a fly on the wall that when my time came, I was better positioned. There's still going to be hard. There's still going to be obstacles. They're still learning. I'm still learning every single day, but it's about a commitment. It took me. 15 plus years to get to a level to be a professional in the NFL. And I don't suspect that in business, it would be any different. So I made the time while in the last couple of years of my career to make sure that I was focusing there. And so when I did get done, I wasn't starting from ground zero. Awesome. Thanks. It's kind of cool. Yeah, and I can attest that was definitely not an easy program. So I still don't know how you did that <laughs> flying back and forth every week. Um, Jay, I want to come back to you. Um, and technology is changing every single day, and especially with what you're doing and how the product that you are continuing to build so people can get a sense of what these athletes are seeing when they're on the field or on the court. What are some of the challenges that you face with changing technology? And um, how do you keep your product up to date? Like, how do you keep up with all the changing technology? Remember what I just said about learn, learn, learn? <laughs> um, well, the, the speed of technology um, can be an, your enemy or your best friend, right? So if you've never heard of Moore's Law, uh, look it up, but it's true. And so um, because Moore's Law is true, uh, there are things we can do today we, we couldn't do a year ago, and there's things we can do a year from now we can't do today because technology is changing so fast. So you got to stay on on top of that. Um, ways I think about doing that is with whom I assimilate and spend time with, right? So I'm always around experts, you know, all the time. Learn, 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 learn. What's the latest this? What's the newest that, right? Where have you used this? Where have you seen it fail? Talking to all the people I can in, in our ecosystem, right? So talking with NBC Sports, talking with, with Fox Sports, talking with Intel and Sony and the companies who build the components that we need. Um, and then really having a sort of a menu in front of us at all times so we can always be picking and choosing the, the best uh, technology at the time, right? But then it's incumbent upon us to be able to do what I call the system integration, right? So having a menu of what's out there, but then you got to figure out how do you pull it all, all together and do it in a modular way. And I know Hawk can tell you the same thing, right? Doing it in a modular way because 18 months from now, he's going to be using a different camera system, probably, right? but it can't tank the whole rest of the system. The platform's going to change. There's new AI coming, right? There's all kinds of things we can, we can do, but we've got to really keep our eye on, on the ball and be able to you know, connect the dots and integrate the latest technologies out there. Definitely. So Jose, I want to jump to you real quick. Um, as someone who is always advocating for diverse founders um, and underrepresented founders, how do you, what are some of the things that you suggest to carve your own space in this tech world, right? Because there's only but so many ideas out there. There's only but so many ways you can reinvent the wheel. So what are the things that you suggest that people can do that they can carve their own space and stand out? Yeah, um, 
I think bringing your strengths to the table uh, and and identifying uh, what unique experiences uh, allow you to have unique insights into problems that exist in the world. Um, uh, most of the a lot of the successful entrepreneurs I've seen are solving problems that they've seen and um, and whether they, they observe them or they have a unique insight into whether it's some sort of new advertising technology, right? Somebody's been working in, te- in advertising for 10 years and they see that there's an inefficiency, so they, they try and solve it, right? Um, just uh, just because your experiences are more different from others uh, doesn't mean you haven't seen problems and faced problems that are probably common with others. Uh, and so when you can combine your strengths as an individual, uh, whether it's in engineering or design or marketing or leadership or whatever it might be, uh, and, and combine that with the problems that your skill sets can solve, uh, I think that that is that is a recipe for a powerful recipe, right? Where, um, as opposed to going after a problem that's out there, that you see it in an area that's totally totally foreign to you, and say, okay, I'm going to go tackle that problem, but your skills don't necessarily bring anything towards that problem, nor do you really understand that problem. Um, yeah, that's just my my personal way. I, 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 there's plenty of people that have been successful, probably going after and tackling a problem that's out there, but. Uh, the way I've always gone about it, I go around with a with a notebook. Uh, well, now it's physical, right, or, or digital on my on my phone. And when I see problems and inefficiencies in the world, I write them down and come up with ideas of how to solve them. And a lot of the different businesses I've come up with over the years have come from that. Um, and so, yeah, it, what you're looking at, the, the problems you see, there's plenty of people who can find problems, but there's very few who then do anything about them. And if you can again merge your skill sets with with uh, with with big pain points, you can uh, you can add value in a way that you can then extract revenue and, and and build a business out of that. Yeah, I think that's great, and I think one thing that I took from what you said too is um, just bringing your personal skill sets and using that to just make whatever you're working on greater, right? I think, especially when people are thinking about starting a tech startup, everyone thinks you need to have this big tech background or engineering background, but maybe you're a really, really good marketer, right? And you can bring that to whatever company you're working with. So I think that's great. Um, We did get a question from Emmanuel. Can you guys give some examples of a pivot that you had to do, which made a difference in the success of your startups? That's for everyone. Yeah, I could start that off. So I, I, one pivot um, that I I made, and I think this is kind of just rings through throughout our company and our success so far is that um, I ended up partnering with my co-founder, Troy Jones, um, who has been amazing. I mean, we first met, I believe, in 2017 um, and officially partnered in 2019, um, but began those conversations in 2018 of just how we come together. We had both started this track in round 2015. And, you know, you have this singular mindset of how you expect things to go. And right. And I think whenever you're building a vision, it is important, you know, for you to 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 make sure that you are guiding the the, the vision for the company. But the pivot for me was I felt like there was a scenario where one plus one equals three. Right. And those are what you you look for. And I think it was the best decision that both of us had made. To say, okay, this isn't somebody I grew up with. This isn't somebody I went to college with. I actually don't work well with others because I do work really, really hard. And whenever you have somebody who put so much in, right, wrong, or indifferent, you know, sometimes there's an imbalance if somebody else isn't like that and that can cause resentment. But me and him, we are both those similar kind of people. And I think that pivot of which I didn't expect to happen of kind of building this vision with both of us um, has led to the early success that we've had so far. Jay? Yeah, for me, I mean, the, f- the first pivot was to start this in the first place, right? To go from what I what I was doing to um, what I'm doing now. M- most people wouldn't do that and shouldn't do it, frankly, because like Hawk said, it's not easy. Um, but, you know, so, so far, so good. So a lot of the people in the audience are, you know, they're entrepreneurs, they're thinking about entrepreneurship. That's a big pivot. Um, a pivot that we're potentially in the process of even right now is in uh, with whom we're partnering with. Um, There's a company out there that we thought was a competitor of ours. And I recently met with them 
and learn that maybe not so much. And so, so how do we do that? Okay, spent time with them, signed the NDAs. What do you really want to do, company? Here's what we really want to do, our company. Okay, there's an actual synergy there. And by the way, the world is such a big place that, you know, even if five of us did what we're trying to do, there's still more demand than we could possibly um, supply. So I'm sort of doing a real-time potential pivot in partnering um, <clears throat> right now. So that's another another example how to how I thought about it and, and executing it. Jose. Yeah, so with Boomtown Accelerators, we started back in 2013. So it's been uh, almost a decade, which is exciting. Uh, in the beginning, or from the beginning, we've always been entrepreneurs trying to help other entrepreneurs pursue their dreams, give them this, the resources they need to build the companies that they want to, they want to go after. Um, a lot of the accelerator world usually comes at it from the investment point of view of how you know how to raise the money you need. And we, we said, look, there's plenty of people solving that problem, but there's not that many that are actually helping the entrepreneurs build solid businesses, figure out how to solve real problems, how to re generate revenue. Um, and so that, that was our focus from the start. And the way we did it is we would raise funds and deploy that to support the, accelera the accelerator companies that would join our program. Uh, the pivot that happened about six, seven years ago uh, was identifying that um, there was another need in the market, which was on the corporate innovation side. There are very big corporates who want to innovate um, and they want to connect with startups, uh, but there's a gap of how to actually do that. And there are startups who would absolutely love to work with large corporates as potential clients, uh, but they don't necessarily know how to do that, especially if you know you, you haven't been surrounded by people in, the, in that space. So. Uh, we started working with corporate clients uh, as a pivot, as an experiment, which ended up being uh, an experiment we pursued uh, as a direction for the company, which was let's uh, bring our expertise in innovation and in building companies towards the corporate world um, and basically focus instead of raising funds to uh, fund things ourselves, let's work with corporates to support these entrepreneurs. So uh, that has been a, a pivot that so far we've seen a lot of success in, and it's it's really what's led to the focus of our program, which is bridging the gap between entrepreneurs at many levels uh, and, and and corporates who want to bring such innovation to, to the big leagues. Thanks, Jose. Hawk, I know you have to jump, but I have one quick, quick, quick question. Um, it's usually my final question I ask. What is something that you wish someone would have told you? going through this process. So something you wish you would have known at the beginning, but you wanna kind of give the keys a little bit to the next entrepreneur, next startup who may be in their startup process. That's a great question. What is something that I wish somebody would have told me? Um, I probably touched on it uh, a little bit earlier. I do think that in this entrepreneurial process, I think, if you're looking at social media, if you're hearing, you know, all everyone talk that everything is great. I think sometimes they paint the picture way more rosy than it actually is. This is a very hard thing. It's tough to bring something um, from nothing. It's tough to create. It's tough to, you know, process this out. And there's so many steps within that. You deal with not only raising capital, you deal with personalities, you deal with partnerships, you deal with competitors coming in, you deal with the uh, the macroeconomics, right? And I think there's so much work that needs to be put in that there's so much of yourself that you got to put in. And that's, again, you have to be wired a certain way to sign up for that. Um, otherwise it will feel like you get punched in the mouth. Right. And, and, and a lot of times that could lead to failure. And I, I mean, it's something that's I'm 1000% out of a, you know, a thousand times out of a thousand, I would have signed up for, but if you're just looking at social media and it's saying, Hey, go start your business, go do this. It's easy. It's, that's just not a reality. And I wish more people would, uh, you know, express that to people that want to go into this. Yeah, I need people to stop listening to LLC Twitter. Um, but Paul, thank you so much. We really appreciate you taking out your time, especially on a day like today, which I know your schedule is wild. So yep. good luck, with all draft stuff. Um, yeah, and where can people find you? And yeah, status you can, Pro. Yeah, you can, uh, status.pro is our website, um, status.pro on Instagram, status pro on Twitter, um, at Hawk on any of the platforms. So if anybody wants to connect or give me a shout, let me know you were here and we'll exchange some, uh, some direct messages. Awesome. Thanks so much, Hawk. Absolutely. Thank you guys for having me. Hi. Uh, so we did get a question from Parole. 
Um, if you want to start a tech startup, but neither co-founder has tech engineering experience, would you say that you need to get another co-founder with a tech background or can you pitch for VC funding to be able to hire a tech expert? Jose, I kind of want you to jump in there first. Uh, yeah, absolutely. One of, the, one of the biggest things we look for um, when supporting entrepreneurs uh, and, and, and choosing to invest in them uh, is whether you put together the team uh, that has the skill set to fulfill the vision that you're putting forth, right? So we don't define what your team should look like, but you need to make the case that who you have put together can fulfill the vision you're telling us you want to go after. So if that means it's a software product, I would expect you to have an engineer on board. Um, if and and one of the reasons I say that it's a little bit harsh, right? But uh, if you're asking. Uh, the, the same skill set you need to raise money from a VC um, in order to convince them to part with their money uh, is the same skill set you need to convince a co-founder to join your company in order to part with their time, right? So you need to be able to share a vision. You need to be able to, um, you know, have a, a compelling problem that you want to go after and a potential solution. Um, and so if you're, if you've tried and, and are unable to bring on a engineering or, or whatever marketing or any sort of co-founder, um, then I would actually question whether you have what it, you're ready to make that same type of pitch to an investor uh, in order to then bring on that person, right? So I would say it's less about having access to that person and more about whether your messaging and your vision and your, you know, your, just the, the problem you're going after and everything is, is compact enough and, and compelling enough. Um, so what I would say is, uh, Try, you know, start getting, start talking to people, start talking to entrepreneurs, go to meetups if you need to. Just get, um, don't, don't be so shy about somebody's trying to steal your idea. It's really, even if, even if you said, I'm going to recreate Facebook right now, there's a difference between having the playbook and actually executing. It's, it's, it's very difficult to really copy somebody else's idea. Um, you're going to end up in very different places. Uh, so don't be afraid of just talking about what you're doing and in sharing your vision and talking to people, you will find that one, your messaging gets refined and you'll, you'll start seeing what resonates with people um, where like they start nodding or they kind of go blank as, as you share it. And so you kind of do some A-B testing there, but also you'll find people that hear your vision and say, oh my goodness, that sounds amazing. Can, can we work together? Is there any way I can help? Can, you know, any way we can collaborate? Um, so I would say, make it a priority to bring on who you, who you need for your team. That way, you know, worst case scenario, you don't raise any money, but you can still execute because you guys can, can build your product without having to go out and raise money. But if you do need to raise money, you're going to need that team anyways. So. Emmanuel, I see you raise your hand. I, um, I just had a follow-up question. Uh, the last topic, um, I know one of the, one of the, um, Part of your response, Jose, was about uh, you know the, bridging that gap with um, the, uh, creating more opportunities for emerging companies. Uh, I wanted to know what is that process like for, like for for you and and some of the partners that you work with uh, that are looking out for opportunities to to uh, partner with early stage companies. What is what is what does that evaluation process look like? What are some of the things that you look for? and uh, some of the value add that you think, uh, you know, early stage companies can bring? Thanks, Emmanuel, that's a, that's a great question. Um, so what the, the ideal company for us specifically, we've, we've learned over the years, um, is a company that has a strong founding team, right, who can execute on your vision. Uh, and the product has to be mature enough um, th this is specific for our program, right? The product has to be mature enough that if NBC Sports, for example, said, can we do a pilot or do a test of this um, to a small audience that within a reasonable period of time, a week, a few days, you can get it off the ground. Um, so if it would take you, you know, if they ask you to do some sort of test together and you say, well, I need three to four months to develop it. I might need to raise a little bit of funds in order to build it out. Um, then you might be a bit too early uh, for our program. Um, so the ideal team, again, has a uh, strong founding team, uh, strong, uh, mature product. And it, is, it isn't so much about the maturity of the business. So you can be pre-revenue, 
But it, what matters is that the product is mature enough that if there's an opportunity with one of our partners that you can quickly do something together. And then beyond that, what happens is we have an application process um, at comcastsportstech.com. Um, you can uh, fill out an application and it takes about 15 minutes. And we, we look for companies, not so much that we know will, there will be a deal, but rather that fit the description of what, of what our partners are looking for in general. And the very cool thing about our program is the next step after that is you, we actually put you in front of our partners and our partners go through the top 50 companies and identify which ones they are interested in learning more about that they, they potentially match some of their innovation priorities for that year. And from there, we take the top 25 and you actually interview directly with our partners. So you'll have the executives of these different groups that you'll be able to speak to and actually have the conversation of what could a relationship look like between you two. Uh, and so by the time you potentially get an invitation for a program, you know exactly, you know with, with pretty good certainty who is interested in you, what that could look like, um, and, and um, what other partners could potentially also be a fit. So, be, so in order for us to um, extend an invitation, uh, the number one thing that we're really measured on is how many deals we can end up forming between the startups and, the, and our partners. So if we extend an invitation to you is because there's very strong evidence that there will be some deals that come from this. Uh, and, and, and so it makes it a very unique program in the sense that we're not here to overpromise and underdeliver. Uh, if the partners want to work with you, uh, then you know, you'll know you potentially get an invitation. Um, and if not, then we're not going to try and convince you to join something that, uh, that you're not going to get deals out of because just because you're a good company, if you don't get deals, then you know, we, don't, we don't win. We, we win when you get deals. Uh, and so it kind of aligns our interest uh, pretty well. Thanks so much, Jose. So Jay, I kind of want to um, bring back the topic of like your networks, right? We talked about finding, um, and it's going to be a two-part question. Okay. So we, for piggybacking off of Parole's question about like having the right people on board, right? So one, how do you tap into your networks? Um, to make sure that you are getting the right person, the right people, right, on your teams? And um, how do you go about finding the right team? Like, how do you know that this person, and I know it's probably a trial and error, but how do you, what's that thing that you're like, okay, this person is gonna be the person to help me take my business to the next level? Well, you don't, you don't want too much trial and error, right? Right. <laughs> uh, I'd say that the first thing about tapping into the network is having a network. Uh, and all of us need a bigger network. Uh, so it's it's having one and you, you all have a network. And if you think hard about it, it's probably bigger than you initially would think, right? Oh, I know so-and-so. And oh, by the way, you go on LinkedIn and he knows so-and-so and she knows, right? So the network, thanks to digital, is probably bigger than than you than you think it is. Um, and I would say continuous effort, like I was talking about earlier, like learn, learn, learn is network, network, network all the time, right? Um, my in my world, I, I started with um, folks that I knew from our the industry I had come from, which was digital. So my co-founder, I worked with him at at Accenture in in a, the digital space, um, and so that was the beginning of the of sort of the the networking and people in that space know other people in that space, and so that's how that that sort of grew. Um, I'd also say, and Jose kind of touched on this: go go to where they are, right? Where are, the, where are the kinds of people that, that you want to meet? And, and then go there. Exhibit A, Sports Business Journal, Tech Week. Mm -hmm. So Hawk and I didn't know each other before that event, but we both spoke that event, right? And so now we know each other, right? And now if you listen to what he's doing and we're doing, they're somewhat related, right? So there's an immediate partnership potential, right? Which we've already, already talked about. So going to where the people are that you want to find um, be on the ground and then you, you'll meet them. Right. But you gotta be gregarious and outgoing enough to, to meet them. And then the second part of your question is how do I know I got the right person? Mm -hmm. Um, a lot of discussions, right. And talking to them about, well, how, here's what I'm thinking. How do you think about it? Right. Almost, almost open-ended a little bit about what's their, what's their background. What do they like? Do I like them in the first place? Spend a lot of time with them. Right. Um, so go where they are, um, meet them when you get there, and then just listen and see what questions they ask you. 
Awesome. Thanks so much, Jay. So before we transition into the actual tips and trips tricks for applying to an accelerator program, um, I want to kind of have both of you answer my final question that I love to ask. So both for Jay and Jose, um, what are what is something that you wish someone would have told you? Oh, you asked Hawk that already. Yes. Uh, let's see. Well, the, the typical thing people say, well, this is really hard. And I wish I knew how hard it was and all that. That wouldn't have changed my mind at all, um, which is part of my sort of talking point on having the audacity and the guts to do this in the first place, right? Um, what I wish somebody told me, I'll have a better answer when we complete our funding. And the reason I say that is because the funding is very hard, especially in this environment. And so once you get the right investor or set of investors, I will be telling you then, God, I wish I met this person a year ago. Right. Right. Um, but because you don't know that yet, you have to turn over, you know, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of rocks, I guess I'd say. Um, so, so far there isn't a, um, a big thing that I feel like I missed because someone didn't tell me. So far, I think I feel as if we were doing the the right the right things. Um, you know, joining this accelerator was definitely one of the one of the right things. Um, so, for anyone out there who's thinking about doing it, I'm telling you now to apply to it. So you can't say nobody didn't tell me, right? Um, so let me let me pause there and hand it over to Jose. Absolutely, I, I think on the continuing on that people topic, I think the the number one thing someone I wish would have told me, and, and thankfully, I, I think I stumbled upon it pretty early, but was uh, entrepreneurship is a lonely journey and it's it's all about the people. And mm -hmm. every single time I've seen a founder compromise on the people side and say, well, they have the right skills, but they're nice or vice versa, you know, or really like them, but they don't have the skills or whatever, like um, it, it doesn't usually end too well. Um, and although I would always err on the side of liking them and, and actually <laughs> trusting them than, uh, than the other way around, having skills but not trusting them. Uh, I found, you know, if you can get a co-founder, try it. Uh, try and bring somebody on board with you because if anything, you're gonna go through the journey with somebody else and build a really strong relationship along the way. Uh, but doing entrepreneurship by yourself is, is hard. It's long hours, it's thankless. You know, statistically, you're not going to be successful uh, uh, with any given venture, um, you know, especially if it's like your first one. Uh, and that's OK. There's a lot of learning along the way. But if you can do it with somebody else, your odds of success do go up and uh, it makes it more enjoyable. Some of the great memories I have in past failed companies have been being in the trenches, staying up till, you know, nine in the morning, working on the product release for an investor pitch uh, and, and, and just, you know, laughing and, and crying along the way. Uh, and, and, you know, uh, all that um, that goes with it. Uh, and, and to that end, make sure that you're nurturing those relationships with your team because um, uh, the company, companies that have failed for me in the past have been because team dynamics fall apart, not because the product wasn't working. Um, and the companies that have done well uh, have done well in spite of opposition and challenges and even lack of product market fit at first, because if you have the right people at for, um, on board with you, you can overcome adversity. You can overcome challenges and failures and pivot and iterate. And because you trust each other and you, you can complement each other, um, you can overcome those things and actually make those into learning opportunities and growth opportunities. Uh, but if you don't have the right people, then the smallest challenge can be the end of your business. Definitely. One thing I will say, Jose, is I really appreciate your honesty on this call. You have not sugarcoated anything. And I think it's important, especially for startup founders, to know like the realities. And same for you, Jay. Like, thank you so much to know the realities. Like, you're probably going to fail and it's going to be trial and error. And it's just about what you do next. So I'm going to just launch two polls before we go into our next section. Um, I just wanna get an idea of how many people on this call identify as a founder of color. And then as well as, um, oh, I think I have to end that poll. Maybe I can launch both at the same time. No, I can't. Um, and then I'm gonna launch another one to just see like how many people on here see themselves as investors or founders. So please answer that poll if you see it. And um, 
then we'll go into our next couple of questions. So going into the applying for accelerator program section, Jose, um, Jose um, what are the key three things that you think someone should include in their applications? Yeah, um, and that depends for the type of uh, program you're, you're applying to. Um, in in our case, I, I will say that there's pretty good overlap. Uh, understanding of uh, explaining what your team, you know, your team background and making sure that you highlight um, some of the things that makes your team uniquely suited to pursue this problem, right? So if you've got two teams pursuing the same thing, let's say it's ad tech and one's been working in ad tech for a long time, the other one's not, <laughs> uh, you know, that, that relevant background will will stand out and, uh, and it'll make you think, okay, this is the type of team that could potentially solve this problem. Um, uh, doing thinking, in our case, doing thinking around how could you work with our partners? Uh, so we do have startups and unfortunately get excited about, um, uh, that get excited about working with our partners, but they don't actually have any idea of what that could look like. Uh, like, it'd be great to have, you know, WWE as one of our, uh, as, a, as a logo of, of our client or whatever, but then when it comes down to it, there's not real understanding of how, what value you could add to them or even vice versa, uh, they could add to you. So just doing a little bit of thinking of that, it doesn't mean you have to have the right answer, but just, you know, just th thinking through that um, is really helpful. Um, and, we, and we're also glad to answer questions for you if you're not sure and you want to get some clarity uh, in that. Um, and, uh, and then, yeah, just uh, I'd say clarity around the maturity and, and traction that you might have for your product, right? So if you've launched your product with three or four corporate partners in, or, or businesses in the past or you have 10,000 users or whatever it might be, um, just making sure that it's clear that you've got some validity. And, and specifically, I would say even more important than the number of users I would say is what you've learned from that. So, uh, you know, if you've got 10,000 users, but you don't know a single thing about them, uh, that's one thing. But if you've got a thousand users or 500 users, but you see that, you know, the engagement is X percent per day or X number of minutes per day, you know, this is the turn rate. And this is, you know, we learned that this is how we acquire customers that stay around longer versus those that bounce off really quickly. Uh, that's actually more interesting than 10,000 random users that maybe you just dumped money into Google ads for, but you have no idea you know, anything, you know, anything about them. So uh, those are just some, some high level points. Thanks so much, Jose. Um, I see someone who has not changed their name. That's a great question. Um, how do you, are you able to pay yourselves in the startup phase? And Jay, I'd like you to jump into that one. Okay. Um, let's see the short answer to the long answer. Uh, yes, there's a lot is the longer answer. <laughs> Um, the, the shorter answer is um, don't do it until you absolutely can afford to do it um, and pay yourself last and don't pay yourself a lot. Uh, so part of that is the preparation before even go into this world is do you have the, the funds? Can you live for you know X amount of time without getting paid at all? Have you built up enough of a, of a war chest so that um, you're, you're comfortable for a year or two of not getting paid, right? And then only getting paid once you hit certain certain milestones. And if you're like most startups, you're gonna have to raise money. And one of the things they're gonna ask you is, well, are you getting, are you paying yourself? Yeah, right? And that answer could be yes, yes or no. And it could be good or bad, depending on what's the revenue of the company at the time, et cetera. So yes is the short answer, but the you know, longer answer is, be prudent about when you do it, how much it is, um, and pay yourself last. I would like to add one quick thing to that. If you can, um, I think one of the best things to invest in is a bookkeeper or an accountant, someone who can manage your books for you and really understands that process. I know for me, that's been very helpful for me to see how much money is coming in, how much money I can spend without getting in trouble with the IRS and how much money I can pay myself. So you get an accurate view of like what each dollar stands for. So um, I think that was one of the best pieces of advice that someone gave me is to like hire a bookkeeper, someone who can, if you can, not everyone can, you know, afford it at this stage, but I definitely think it's something that could be helpful. Um, uh, I also add, sorry, uh, to no. I'd add that, um, you know, I, sometimes you can't. Uh, I, I, for, for Boomtown itself, I, we went, uh, the founders, 
uh, went about two and a half years without a salary, uh, putting it back towards our employees and towards supporting entrepreneurs, believing that in the long term it, it would be worthwhile. Um, and uh, and it and it was hard. And and in the past, I've gone, you know, uh, I've worked at multiple founder multiple startups where I was working at a coffee shop in the evenings to try and cover cover costs and, and doing that for years uh, yeah. until you can get enough momentum and and and, um, and the resources you need. So I would say um, one advice I often give entrepreneurs is if you've got a full time job that you enjoy, that is an extremely demanding that allows you to work part time on your on your business or on the side uh, to continue to do that rather than quit your job. Um, there's a time when you should quit, but if you uh, if you, you don't have enough traction, if you're still the idea stage. Sorry, my, my side is walking. <laughs> uh, if you're still at the, uh, at, at, you know, at the, at the early stages, you've essentially, th your employer becomes your founder, your, your investor, right? Um, and, and you're, as opposed to, you know, spending, you know, 10 hours or, eight, you know, five hours of each day raising funds uh, or trying to raise funds when you're early on, you could spend those five hours doing your job. And then a lot of people are more productive with one or two hours at the end of each day to get it to, you know, than they would if they had eight hours anyways. Um, and you, when you're in a working environment, you've got people that you can potentially bounce ideas off of, or even they might join your business, right? And be a, a co-founder. So I'd say be very careful and conscious about when you quit your job, because sometimes the advice is just quit right away and go after it. And there might be a time for that, or if you've got enough validation, yes. And, and maybe if you've been working on your startup for three, four, five years, and you know it's time to do it, yes. But uh, that shouldn't necessarily be your default, especially if you're strapped for resources and, uh, and, and money is an issue. Figure out a way to do both if you can. You might end up being more productive than otherwise. Oh, that's great advice. So we did see that um, about 70% of the people who answered the poll um, were founders of color, so that's great to know. And I just launched another poll to um, see what the split is for people who see themselves as investors or founders or both. Um, so I do want to open it up for questions. We have about five minutes left. Does anyone have any questions or thoughts? You can raise. Let's make a quick uh, statement here. Plug. Mm -hmm. Um, so you'll, you'll notice that uh, my background is from 2022. Um, our logo's over um, your, my left shoulder. Uh, we, one of the things we did was apply to this uh, sports technology accelerator. And for those of you who are thinking about it, it's one thing for Jose to tell you like why it's good. It's another thing for someone who applied and did it tell you why it's good. Um, and it's very good. So I would think about the things that you need to do to prepare yourself to apply to things like this and to be accepted uh, into something like this. It's super, super valuable. Um, and I, you know, I would say that the testament and we're out of it now, it's over for us. Well, kind of over, You're, we're in the family, but <clears throat> when I get on calls like this and I, and I see the people that we worked with and I, and I smile and I see Brady and Mark and, and Jose, it was, it was just a good, experience with good people and back to learn, learn, learn. Like I, I, there's no possible way we'd have learned as much as we did and been connected with the people we had, had we not, had we not done this. So that's, uh, that's my plug. And I know, um, China, you like to ask people, what are you most proud of? And being accepted into this was definitely one of those things on my list. Thanks. And that is a great testimonial. So I appreciate that, Jay. Um, Brady's question, what is a book, person, or experience that has been influential in your career? And what's the next audio book in your list or what book is on your nightstand? Well, firstly, Jay, thank you for the kind words. I really appreciate that. Uh, right, um, I think a book that's been really powerful, I know we have a few minutes here, a couple of minutes is uh, Power of Habit. Uh, the, um, and basically it's about identifying what habits you have entrenched in your life that either have negative repercussions and, or, or what opportunities you might have to, uh, or, or what habits you can, how to create habits that stick, um, whether, whether it's to stop and identify bad habits or to create good ones. Right. Um, and it, it was a very powerful book that has led to many other learnings, including reading consistently <laughs> uh, and, and making that a part of my job, essentially to learn and to take care of my body and everything. Uh, so the power of habit is one I would, I would recommend. 
I would say uh, anything by Gladwell, Malcolm Gladwell. Um, he, he's excellent. And just the way of thinking about how the world works, I think is really important for an entrepreneur. Um, why will somebody believe what I'm saying? Why will somebody buy what I'm, what I'm building? How does the world work? The, um, and the other thing I do is I listen to a lot of podcasts and right now, a lot of those are around, uh, fun fundraising. So like Jose said, take care of your body and your mind at the same time podcast, something you can do while you're on the treadmill, right. Or out running. So that's the topic du jour for me right now. Thank you guys. So last question before we shut it down. Um, Jose, you talked about being ready, right? You talked about knowing when you're ready, um, when you want to apply to these accelerator programs. So when would you say is the right time to apply? How would a founder know, hey, my business is ready. I have all the right tools in place that's going to make me be a really great candidate for this accelerator program. Yeah, and, and that's different, uh, as I mentioned before, it's different for each accelerator and doing your research is, is important. So doing your research for this one is, uh, by being here is, is a good way to do it. Uh, the right time I think is when your product is ready to take advantage of resources, uh, specifically partnerships with, with uh, some major brands that you, you see up here. Um, if if you, you, your primary um, focus is uh, the product development, or if it's fundraising and such, then perhaps it's not the right time for this. The, this program is really good when you've got a product that's ready to grow and, and get out there and get exposure uh, and, and be able to take advantage of, um, of as many deals as we can put in front of you. Uh, so that's kind of for you to decide. Uh, but if you, think, if you think you're ready to get pilots and commercial deals off the ground, then it's the right time to apply. Awesome, awesome. Um... I see here that Jay and Jose's emails are in the um, chat. So just for anyone who wants to connect with you, obviously email, but if what are other ways that everyone can connect with you and where can they find your companies? Oh yeah, LinkedIn's another one. So just put my name into LinkedIn and uh, everything can flow from, from there. One, the one thing I'd add to what Jose said was, um, you may not know that you're ready to apply, but if you're close, uh, I would say do it because you'll you'll get feedback along the way too, right? If they if they don't pick you, you know you'll you'll learn well what what's what's the reason, um, and you'll be better prepared, you know the the next time. Nothing ventured, nothing nothing gained. If you're in the ballpark, start swinging. Awesome. Thank you guys. Do you guys have anything else to add before we sign off? Fantastic job as a host. Thank you, Jay. I appreciate that. <laughs> and thank you both for coming on and taking time out of your day to spend your lunch break with us. So I appreciate you both. This was amazing. Everybody. Thank you for hosting. Thank you. And thank you everybody for coming on and attending. As we said, we'll be sharing this recording with everyone who registered. So um, if you came in late, don't worry, you'll still be able to watch the full thing. So thanks again, everyone, and have a great day. Bye. Bye.